Check, check. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Layer 1 2009. I'm Strom Carlson. Um, so I know I'm not on the schedule to give the talk now. I'm supposed to be giving a talk tomorrow. You should be giving a talk, hearing a talk from um, Joe McRae right now, but he's stuck in, uh, he's in airline hell or something. So they asked me to give this talk at the last minute. And, and it's kind of funny because there's this, this, this form that they give to us when we check in to speak. And it says, please check in with registration for your talk 20 to 30 minutes prior to going on stage. This will let us know that you're in fact around so we don't have to activate emergency plan Omega. And there's a little uh, subscript which says, we have no idea what emergency plan Omega actually is. We're pretty sure it's panic. <laughs> but apparently it's ask Strom to give a talk. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, they, they kind of asked me to give this talk at the very last possible second, and I had to come up with something real quick. So I figured that, you know, since we're here and since there's this Catholic convention next door, I figured let's, let's do a talk on um, uh, gay dating the Catholic way. <laughs> but, no. Th this talk is called Why Your Mother Will Never Care About Linux. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes. Sorry? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? M? <laughs> Make sure it's of that? <laughs> I don't know. We've got to find him. So. <laughs> So anyway, there was, uh, my, um, my aunt got me a birthday card for my birthday a couple months ago. And it was kind of funny. I, I opened it up and the, the card said on the front, for your birthday, I'm going to send you a check for $10,000. And you open it up and inside it says, just as soon as my Nigerian friend that I met on the internet sends me $10 million in government funds <laughs> to deposit in London. I thought it was kind of cute. But yeah, so this is your mother, and this is Linux, and this is why they're never going to talk, never going to care about each other. So, just a bit of a, so as far as why I'm doing this talk, I went through some pretty bad tech burnout a couple, about a year and a half ago. Um, it was, I'd been traveling a lot, I'd been doing a lot of tech work, and I'd gotten about as heavy into tech tech stuff as I had ever in my life. And it got to the point where I just really got sick of it. So this talk is kind of my, okay, why am I burned out and how do I fix it talk. So who wants to guess what these people are standing in line for? How did you ever guess that? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all standing in line for an iPhone. Notice how this guy apparently doesn't want to be seen waiting in line <laughs> for the iPhone. But yeah, this thing, right? The, the Jesus phone? Was that too much of a... <laughs> but yeah, the, the iPhone, right? What's interesting about this is it was announced about six months before it went on sale. And everyone started talking about this thing. Like, really, really, really talking about it. And they were saying all these things about it. They, all they had seen was one demo that Steve Jobs gave in the keynote, right? They'd never touched it. They'd never use it for themselves. They saw a demo. And they started saying things like, this is going to be the most revolutionary device since the year 1984. What? Yeah. I, I was, I mean, I, this was, what, January 2007. I was looking online. I remember this was what everyone was saying. There, there was no, you know, well, let's wait and see. Let's see, you know, what this is going to be like. No, everyone was falling over themselves to praise this thing. And I thought to myself, well, okay. You know, this is a fairly typical claim, fairly typical of what people were saying, right? But let me, let me think about this claim for a second. You know, it, it seems like a calculated date because the mobile phone was introduced in 1983. The, uh, the Macintosh itself was introduced in 1984. Um, compact discs were from the late 70s, early 80s. So maybe it is the most revolutionary device since 1984 because some of the other stuff hasn't really, you know, it's been evolutionary, but not revolutionary per se, right? But then I thought to myself, wait a second. How many of you own digital cameras? Right? How many of you s still use film on a regular basis? 
right? Two of you. The digital camera didn't become a consumer item until 1988 and didn't really become a viable going concern until the beginning of this decade, right? And the digital camera, this simple little device which has now completely replaced film as a consumer product, you know, film was kind of a specialty item, and has caused the stock price of the Kodak company to go into an irreversible tailspin since the year 2000. So you're telling me that the iPhone, that, that, that the camera, the digital camera, which is, has killed the market for consumer film, is re less revolutionary than this dinkus? Right? Uh, sorry? A dingus. Yeah. D-I-N-G-U-S, not, not the rubber boat thingy. But, so, I mean, yeah, the, the, I wouldn't say this is that revolutionary. I mean, for God's sake, there are things that it's only able to do now, which we've kind of taken for granted, <laughs> you know. So, let's take a look at this, right? Why are we so obsessed with these toys? Why do we go so balls crazy about them? Why do we do these things, right? Why are we so obsessed with all of this gadgetry. So let's look at a few different things, right? We're going to look at Apple, right? And, and how people seem to think they can do no wrong. We're going to look at Microsoft and see how some people think they can do no right, right? And we're going to look at Linux, which is kind of like the cult of code and open source. So, let's start by looking at Apple. Apple is you know, a company you all know about. There are some people using Apple computers in this room right now. And it's interesting because Apple is led by a guy named, of course, Steve Jobs, who, I mean, it's kind of interesting when you study the way that Steve Jobs and Apple are so really, really interconnected. The company, when, after he left the company, the company kind of started faltering and just got worse and worse and worse until he came back. And now it's just been getting better and better and better, apparently. It's not like there's a cult of personality going on with this at all, you know? Nothing. I, I don't see that, do you? <laughs> but, I mean, Ad Apple does make some products which are useful. I mean, pe pe these are not bad products. People buy these things, right? I own an iPod. I at one point owned a MacBook until it fell apart. But um, let's not get into that. And these aren't bad products, right? But the, the interesting thing about it is that people are more crazy about Apple products in general than they are about other company products. I mean, there are sort of apocryphal stories of people just noticing that you have a, a, a Macintosh and coming up with their Macintosh and starting to say things like, oh, don't you just love your Macintosh? <laughs> Isn't it the most wonderful thing ever? <laughs> and people are a little nuts about this. I mean, it didn't take long searching online to find people crazy enough to do things like, oh, I don't know, make portraits of Steve Jobs out of Apple icons and product photos and so on. This is a bit obsessive, is it not? I have never seen any other company's product that people will go out and buy and then post photos of themselves, not just posing with, but actually licking the boxes of on Flickr. I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> Shenanigans? <laughs> right? But, I mean, people are undeniably bonkers about Apple for whatever reason, right? And the same people who are bonkers about Apple seem to have more than just a little bit of dislike for Microsoft. I mean, maybe if you're in the Apple camp and you think Apple is the greatest thing since sliced bread or the telephone, right? and you think Steve Jobs is the ultimate and cool, maybe Microsoft just doesn't seem quite as sexy. <laughs> right? <laughs> maybe by comparison to the kind of cool, young, hip image that Apple projects, Microsoft seems kind of maybe old and a bit fuddy-duddy. You know? Maybe, <laughs> what the hell was that noise? <laughs> And, you know, and, and, and you know, honestly, there are some people who, who, who look at Steve Ballmer and see not just this old fuddy-duddy CEO, but someone a little more evil, <laughs> right? 
And, I mean, it, this, this has been going on for years. I mean, people just don't, for whatever reason, th this is ridiculous, right? You know this is ridiculous. You know this is a complete caricature, a complete outrageous caricature of the way things are. I mean, look, Apple does evil things. Apple does good things. Microsoft does evil things. Microsoft does good things, right? They're both reasonably large companies. And, I mean, we know it's childish, but sometimes we do it anyway, right? But even Steve Jobs said this is kind of childish, right? He said, we have to let go of this notion that for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. Do you have any, any of you remember, remember when he said this? No? We have to let go of this notion that for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. The era of setting this up as a competition between Apple and Microsoft is over as far as I'm concerned. Do any of you remember when he said this? No? 1997, right? When Apple had just bought Next and Steve Jobs was back in the helm at Apple and Apple was about this close to no longer existing at all, right? And he said, okay, well, this is one of the things that's, you know, killing the company. This is tearing us apart, this childish, stupid, you know, us versus them mentality, right? This has to stop. This is over, you know? And clearly that lasted. So, now, what's interesting is that there are kind of two split-offs from Microsoft camp, right? There's, there's the Apple fanboys, and there are the Linux fanboys, who also seem to hate Microsoft with a passion if they're open source people, right? And what's interesting about Linux is, you know, there are certain things that it does really, really well, and there are certain things that it does really, really badly, right? It works great for server applications. Absolutely wonderful for server applications. I got Linux servers running my web server. I've got them in my apartment. I've got a file server. I've got a PBX, right? And yet, for whatever reason, Linux as a desktop operating system is still not really a going concern. It's gotten better, right? But it's still kind of a bit of a joke, right? You know, you, you wouldn't really seriously use Linux as your desktop OS in a business setting unless all you ever did was work with Linux servers, right? Because all you would ever really need was the terminal window, right? And the really, really cool looking terminal window. And then the, the thing on the side that shows you all your, uh, all your system stats, the CPU speed and the temperature and how much RAM you got left and whatnot, right? But I mean, it's not really a serious business, business desktop application, right? And so to kind of see what people are saying about this, all we have to do is go to the world's greatest source of instant bullshit, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and see what people are saying, right? Just, just do a search for Linux and see what comes up. So, here are some screenshots. There's, just after I converted my personal laptop over to Linux only, I found out I might have to be traveling some for work. So I just loaded Windows back, right? So this guy obviously understands it's not a going concern. And then there are the people who you know, think, oh my gosh, Linux, I can put Linux on anything. I can put it on a toaster, I can put it on a, a water glass, I can run my microphone on Linux, <laughs> right? <laughs> and like, like, like this guy, right? I'm salvaging files from Pentium 133, so I can retire it. I can't believe it's still working. Maybe I can resurrect it with, resurrect it with Linux, right? I mean, it's not even worth the electricity to run that thing anymore, right? My telephone, for God's sake, is, I think, 100 times more powerful than that machine, right? And then, of course, you just get the people who are very clearlessly just hopelessly gone. Like, I found this one. This is the guy's Twitter background, by the way. The Ubuntu desktop. And it's, it's, it's a, you know. And then you look at the rest of what he says, and it's all jokes like this. It's all Windows bashing, yay Linux jokes. Right, I mean, nothing else. The guy has got a one-check mind, right? The, the, the penguin icon, and yeah. And this is kind of crazy, right? Why are we obsessing over the tool? What difference does it make what tool we use as long as the tool allows us to complete a job, right? I mean, you don't go around looking at a cab, you know, woodwork that someone has put together, right? Or, or, or something that someone's nailed to the wall and look at the nail and say, well, this is good, but he only used a Sears Craftsman hammer to hammer it in. You know, you're right. A hammer is a hammer. It hammers the nail in, and as long as the hammer does the job, it, it, it's good, right? 
So why are we so nuts about this, right? I, I, I was looking around. I was just poking around on, on one day. I was looking at, for, for photos of TourCon. And I came across, across this one. We've all seen this, right? Here's the San Diego Convention Center on Twitter, or on Flickr. And so I'm lo looking through this, and, and then I thought, okay, you know, it's, it's a photo, and it's from TourCon, and um, there's people commenting on it, right? Then I noticed something a little weird about this. Do you notice something a little weird about this? Well, I look closer, right? And on, 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 on Flickr, there are these things called groups, where you can put your photo in a group of, of similar photos. So like, you know, uh, photos of cats, or photos of, of dogs, or photos of, of, of glasses of water, or, or whatever your particular fancy is, right? And this one says, hi. I'm an admin for a group called Nikor 55mm f slash 1.2 AI. And we'd love to have this added to the group. Because apparently in the metadata somewhere, um, let's take it with an icon camera, but apparently in the metadata somewhere, it tells you what lens was used to take the photo. So the guy's like, hey, let's create a group only of photos taken with one specific lens. I mean, come on, people. Is this guy out of his mind or what? Right. Yet this is exactly what we do. Right? We idolize the tools. We say, oh my god, my tool is so much better than your tool. I love this tool. This tool is awesome. This tool is perfect. Blah, 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 blah. And we don't really pay attention to, like, does the tool actually do something useful? All right? it's not a, it's, it's, now it's not a question of, this is a nice photo, but it's a question of, oh, here's a photo that was taken with this lens. Right? It's missing the forest for the trees. It's like saying, Oh, this car has awesome wheels, but ignoring the fact that it can't actually go anywhere because the engine's broken, right? So, where does this come from, right? Why do we obsess over things? Why do we obsess over, over these things and not, obs and not pay attention to what people do, right? I mean, like, how many times have you, have you picked up a device or gone to the store and looked at something that you want to buy, some, some electronic toy, some doohickey, and you look at it and you can't figure out how to, do, how to use it? Right? And you, you look through the manual and it still makes no sense. And you think to yourself, ah, probably an engineer built it, right? And, you know, the, the engineer, like, isn't the kind of person in, in this specific case who would have considered, you know, how people use the tool. Right? It's, it's just a matter of, you know, how can I make the tool all whiz-bang and, 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 and happy and, and whatnot, right? So where does this come from, right? Why are we so obsessed with the tool and not paying attention to how people use the tool. Well, I've got a theory which may, as a disclaimer, just be complete bullshit, but here's my theory, right? Think back to a long, 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 long time ago to a place called high school, right? How do you remember this, this, this place? One person remembers high school, wow. Either you're all asleep or you're all repressing your memories, so wake up, <laughs> right? Sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's pretty good, right? But think back to high school, right? How many of you in high school were the popular kid? Right? Accident. There we go. <laughs> right? I wasn't. I sure wasn't, right? And who were the popular kids in high school, right? They were the ones who played sports, right? Which few of us did. They were the ones who were the cheerleaders, which few of us did. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones who threw, you know, the really good parties, right? <laughs> Where everyone and the, you know, everyone came to the party and got really, really wasted, you know, and did really stupid things, you know. And, and did things and did people that they probably regretted the next day, you know. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> right. Yeah, see, 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 now we've got our own thing. It's called DEF CON, which is kind of our, our reaction to that, right? <laughs> but for most of us, that wasn't us, right? For a lot of us, the way we were in high school was more like, you know, this. We're geeks, right? We're a little socially awkward, right? 
And yeah, a lot of us have gotten a lot better recently, but a lot of us in high school were pretty socially inept. I know I was. And, um, you know, some of us have, have grown out of it, some of us haven't. <laughs> right? But what's interesting about this, right, is the way that people respond to this in their lives. Some people will say, you know what? God, I've got a lot of trouble dealing with people. I should spend more time with people and learn how to, inter how to interact with them so that I can be more social and have fun and have friends, right? And some people, but for some people, this whole social interaction thing is way too awkward and way too painful, right? So what do we do? Instead of, you know, instead of becoming social and doing things with other people and learning about the world at large, we retreat. We retreat into our little universes, right, with, with the machine in front of us because the machine won't make us feel bad about ourselves, right? And the machine's easier to deal with than dealing with people. We can control the machine. We can program it. We can make it do exactly what we want instead of dealing with people which are confusing and, and, and unknown and unpredictable, right? And so we retreat into our own little social clique. And hey, here's people who are just like us, who are also socially awkward and who we can kind of talk with things about, talk about with things that we know about. Right? We may not know anything about basketball or baseball, but we sure know a hell of a lot about computers, right? Because, you know, that's all we ever think about. You know? And there, there, there kind of becomes this, this, this social clicky thing where now, to be the popular kid in, in, in the computer click, it's not a matter of being the guy who plays the best basketball or gets the most girls, but the guy who knows the most programming languages or the guy who, you know, knows how to configure a gentoo box from scratch that's running on rocks and and you know has cats pissing on it right <laughs> but something interesting has started to happen i mean geeks and nerds have always kind of been on the outliers of of the social universe for a while until about 15 20 years ago right when being a geek being a computer maniac started to become a little bit cool Right? And then, 10 years ago, when being a hacker became really cool, right? And just as an aside, this movie is 10 years old. Can we please, please, please stop making red pill, blue pill jokes already? Thank you. <laughs> right? But what's interesting about this is that this is an image, right? This is a lifestyle. This is a manufactured thing, right? Yeah, it's all cool to be the guy with the leather coat who knows how to run Nmap. But, you know, there's a difference. There's a difference between, the guy, between being the guy who wrote Nmap and the guy who uses Nmap, right? There's a difference between being the person who's known for doing things, right, and making things and building better tools versus being the guy who is all proud of using those tools, <laughs> right? And, I mean, yeah, this is a little mean, but it's an interesting contrast, right? Because we know people who are known for making tools, and then the other people might, we might derisively call the tool, right? <laughs> but what's interesting about this is that in many geek circles, this is seen as something to strive for, right? You, it, it's sort of like you're the cool person if, if you've got the Ubuntu shirt, right? You're the cool person if you, got, if you went to the con and got all the swag. You're the cool person if you know, you know how to configure 35 different types of web, web servers, right? And yet, we make fun of people for listening to certain kinds of music, right? Or shopping at specific stores, or for buying only specific kinds of products, right? And yet, it's the same thing that's going on, right? We're building identity around these things we use, and these things we consume, and these things we buy, rather than 
building our identity around the way we make the world better, right? I mean, yeah, it's all fine and well to have set up, you know, 100 computers for an office, right? But how about being proud that you not only set up 100 computers for the office, but that you figured out how to make the office function more efficiently, right? And rather than just saying, you know, oh, I set up the computers, but and, and I'm, I'm, I'm the king ship because I set up all the computers, and, and that's the end of that, right? We build our identity, identity around these tools. I mean, it's the point where, you know, you start talking about your specific favorite flavor of Linux, and then someone next to you who thinks that's the most evil thing in the universe because their flavor of Linux is better starts deciding that you are the most evil person in, in existence because you like Debian and they like Gentoo, right? This, this is ridiculous, but we all do it. And well, I guess kind of the, the interesting social engineering upshot of this is that you can use it to your advantage when you're trying to get support for Linux, all right? Because if, if you go onto the channel and you say, you know, hey, you ask politely, like the instructions tell you to, and you ask your well-researched question, and you ask really politely, hey, I'm having some trouble with this auto configuration on an older P4 machine. Would anyone mind giving me some assistance? What happens? <laughs> right? Well, that. What else happens? <laughs> Nothing, right? <laughs> you know, you sit there for, an, for three hours, and you repeat your question every 15 minutes or so, and nothing happens. But you can, if you insult the product, and therefore insult the people who use it because they built their identity around this product, right? And you rant and you say, yeah, this Ubuntu crap is totally fucking useless. This auto configuration won't work correctly on this P4 machine. I don't know why I'm wasting my time on this garbage. This is something I actually had to do, right? I was trying to get this auto config working. I had to resort to this exact line, right? And then I got responses, not these actual responses, but I got responses very similar to these. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, the, I, I, I made these all up, but, but this is very typical of what I saw. Right? And it's interesting because we're getting obsessed with tools, right? Simple tools, complex tools, but they are in fact tools that we're being obsessed over, right? They're just means to an end. They're not ends in and of themselves. They're not worth getting all uptight and, and hot and bothered over, right? And yet, we're totally obsessed with these things. We are totally, we live our lives based around these goddamn machines. You know? And think about it, right? There are machines in all of your uh, garages, apartments, cars, whatever, right? Machines that 10 years ago were awesome, right? I was at, what? I was at the a swap meet in Los Angeles recently. And I was poking around, and yeah, you can get all sorts of like rip-off athletic shoes and, and, and fruits of questionable origin and you know, leather wallets and DVDs and so on, but I found a booth where someone was selling you know, old cordless phones and old computer equipment. I was poking around and hey, there's a Palm 5 just gathering dust. And how many of you still use a Palm 5, right? Or any sort of Palm Pilot? Right? There are things which are gathering dust in all of our apartments, which teams of people poured hundreds of hours of their lives, thousands of hours of their lives into building and creating and perfecting that none of us use anymore, that are totally obsolete, that don't make a difference anymore, right? Yeah, we learned things from them and we've built upon them, but there are many things which were just dead ends. And there are many things which that were dead ends that people got really, really excited about and thought were the future, right? I mean, I'm sure you can think of something which people would think of as a joke and which in retrospect was a joke, right? But which you thought was pretty cool and which you thought was worth devoting your time and effort to, right? 
So this whole thing is getting ridiculous. Because, like, again, we're getting to the point where we, we're building things without considering the people who are going to have to use those things. I mean, for God's sake, how many times have you tried to use some Linux tool that some Linux tool wrote, right? And you try and do something with it, and you can't figure out how to use it, and you can't figure out the error message, and the man page is completely fucking useless, right? How, how many times have you done that? Right? I mean, look, if we don't understand the people that are using these tools, if we don't understand why we're building these tools, the tools are going to become more and more and more and more useless. I mean, look, already half your parents can't use a computer. You know? I mean, mine have gotten better, certainly. I've, I've managed to train them into being able to use the computer and troubleshoot things themselves, but still, it's tough. It's really tough. If you don't grow up around this stuff, you cannot grasp it. And the people who are building these things are young. They're young people like you and I. Younger than me. Younger than you. Right? People who have grown up around this stuff and love the technology, but don't get how people work. And so how do we fix this? Right? How do we save the world? Because if we don't fix this, if we don't save this, right, things are just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and more and more and more and more and more unmanageable until you're trying to order drinks out of a, out of a drink dispenser and everything has a, comes out tasting almost but not quite, quite entirely unlike tea, right? <laughs> so first off, we have to realize that the technology doesn't matter anymore, right? It's not about the tool. It's about what the tool does. It's about how the technology makes our lives better and more efficient and easier to live, right? I mean, yeah. <clears throat> it's great that I can now talk to anyone anywhere at any time, right? But there's a whole slew of problems with the phone in general, right? There's a whole slew of problems with the way the phone itself actually works. I mean, look, my favorite mobile phones were the ones that just, you know, you picked it up, you dialed the number, and you called, and you talked on the phone, right? I mean, yeah, I like being able to browse the web, and I like being able to, you know, SSH from my phone. And I like being able to have my phone connect to my laptop so I can get online. But, you know, I don't like the fact that I have to actually spend time configuring my phone to get it to work the way I want it because by default it's a piece of shit. Right? I'm horrified when I go into coffee shops now because remember when people used to go into coffee shops and talk to each other? Right? And now people go into coffee shops and plop down the laptop and open up the laptop and they sit there and they type and they type and they type and all you see is this. For 30 minutes on end. Right? You see the tops of people's heads and no one talks to each other. Because they're all talking to everyone else. They're all talking to their friends in Milwaukee and, and Sao Paulo and Cape Town and Germany, but not the person next to them. Right? We're, we're so disconnected from each other through this technology of, of communication. Right? And we're obsessed with the tools. We're so, the tools are so overtaking our lives now that we are trying to seek out each other through the tools because none of us remember how to deal with each other in person anymore. You know? We have to discover, you know, the people are more important than the technology. This crap doesn't matter, and you know it doesn't matter, and yet we still go crazy about it, right? We have to replace these things every few years because they wear out and break because they're designed like shit. You know, we, 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 have, we get into arguments over what tool is better, right? We get into arguments over what tool does the better job, right? And it's not like we get, get into arguments over, well, you know, this pen writes better than that pen. Or... This glass is better than that glass. You know, we get into arguments over these complicated tools. We've dug ourselves into this, into, into this hole, right? Because we're so obsessed with the tool that we, we've forgotten that people have to use the tools. And we have to stop doing this bullshit where we build our identity around the tool we use. I mean, yeah, it's all fine and well to be able to configure a Linux server because that's a useful skill because you can... Do something with it, right? You can make it serve web pages that let people get to information, right? Or, you know, you build a really awesome tool 
it's awesome because it never f goes down, right? You've got system set up so that if one fails, a backup system is there so that people can get to the information or people can communicate with each other or people can buy things in their underwear at home 24 hours a day, right? You've, to make it easy for people to do things, to make the quality of life better, right? But not this whole, you know, this whole nonsense where you build your identity around the tool you use and your identity is dependent on that tool. I mean, we all know people like this. Right? We all know people like this who, like for example, IT manager at a company, or a network manager at a company, right? So let's say you've got a problem with the network, the way the network works. And you go to the network manager and you say, hey, I've found this problem. This doesn't work for me. I think I know how to make it better for people because people are having trouble with this, right? The network manager who gets that the network is a tool for people to do things with will say to you, you know, you're right. That is a bad way of doing things. Why don't we work together on making it better? Or tell me what you want and I'll try and work something out for you, right? Versus the person who doesn't get people and the person who doesn't understand people and the person who thinks that the tool is the end all and be all will go, fuck you, not my precious network, right? And you, you laugh, but you've had this happen to you, right? And, right, even worse, you know, the person who comes in, they you know, take over a, a position of authority, and what do they do? They say, well, we've got 1,500 servers running Debian, but I think we should move them all to Gen 2 because I like Gen 2 better. Right? And you laugh, but you've seen it happen more times than you want to admit. And, really, the problem is we need to get away from these damn things more often. You know, we need to get out. We need to interact with each other. And yeah, we're here at a convention and we do interact with each other. And we go out and we, we, we talk and we, we eat together and we, we chat and we have a good time. But there is still the story of the person who shows up at DEF CON with the laptop and finds a power outlet in the hallway and plugs in and sits down on Friday and doesn't move until the end of Sunday except to maybe go to the toilet and get something to eat, right? I mean, yeah, it's great that we socialize with each other, but I think we're still too obsessed with these things, right? And th those of us who are social, yeah, we get it. But there are plenty more of us who don't get the social thing and who are intimidated to even come to these conferences because, oh my God, there are people here and I have to deal with people in person. I don't have this machine between me and the person. It's kind of sad, and we need to figure out some way of, of making it better. Or, if you're still puzzling over the point, and as Matrix succinctly suggested, fucking get a life. <laughs> right. Right. Because if we don't, if we don't figure out how to solve this problem, if we don't take steps to try and say, hey, you know what, let's not promote this whole idea of the tool being the end all and be all, instead let's promote the idea of it being about people, one day, we're going to wake up and come to a convention that's going to be full of people who have this tattoo. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any questions? Comments? Yeah. You missed. <laughs> um, to a point, I'm still burned out on tech. Um, I'm going into psychology now rather than tech because I got sick of tech. So I don't know. I mean, what part of what burned me out was the fact that, you know, I, I had to deal with people like this all the time. And I couldn't deal with people like this anymore because it was impossible to, to get through to them. I mean... All they saw were numbers and and things rather than the end result of those numbers. My, you know, the the story, the, the breaking point for me, I think, was, you know, I was working for an open so a, a company built around this idea of open source software, and I was going around giving classes, you know, teaching classes, teaching people how to use this stuff, 
And so there was software and there was hardware too that, that the company produced. And so for, for the class, we had to go out and, you know, part of the class was you would come and I, you would get all this hardware. And when I went to go teach this one class, which had like, you know, 16, you know, 18 people in it that each paid $3,000 to be there for the week, only half the equipment was there. So I called up and I said, you know, hey guys, um, I think there's been a mistake. Only half the equipment's here. Can you please ship it soon? Because, you know, these people want to take the course and I can't really teach the course unless all this stuff. Okay, sure. Just a second. So I got a call back. We shipped it. Awesome. What's the tracking number? Here's the tracking number. Thanks. I go punch the tracking number. Two day air. <laughs> right? Because all they could see was, oh, that's too expensive. And there was this whole culture because everything was Linux at the company. There was this whole culture of, oh, we can build it ourselves. We can do it for cheap. The first time they sent me out to teach a course, rather than sending out, you know, network cables, they sent a thousand feet of cat five, a bunch of ends and a crimper, <laughs> right? Because that was cheaper. What about your time? They were, I wasn't, that was, that part of the time wasn't in my contract. I learned that lesson, but yeah. But yeah, that, that was, so all they saw were the numbers. They didn't see that, hey, there are people here who are getting angry because they paid a lot of money to take a course and they're not getting the course. So that was the breaking point for me. That's kind of what made me realize that this whole thing is insane. Okay. Any other questions? Accident? What picture? The first line? I'll get to you later. Yeah? Hey, so, uh, what if you comment on your thoughts around social media and actually using technology to connect better with people both you know, across distances, but also, I think, more importantly, who have similar interests? See, the social media thing is really interesting because while, yes, it does have that application, it winds up being a tool for self-aggrandizement, right? Because there, yeah, there are people who use it to communicate with their friends. I mean, I have a Twitter account, and I use it to stay in touch with people I know in real life. But there are people on Twitter, and I'm sure you know of them, who use Twitter to try and get as many people to follow them and, sit and, and read what they say as they can, and who don't really care but just use it to say, oh, look at me, I'm popular now. So, I mean, I, I, th I think the term that, that's entered the lexicon is social media douchebag, right? <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, we, we, we laugh, but it's, it's true. You know, there are people who, who use the, the, the tool to just for self-aggrandizement. Self and so to that end, you know, it's just an outgrowth of the same problem. It's, it's taking people who don't know how to interact with people, giving them a tool to interact with people, and then watching them horribly misuse the tool. In the back. Hang on, there's a mic coming your way. Wow, high tech. <laughs> Earlier you spoke uh, about the big hype over Apple, and um, to be honest, both my parents use Windows machines. And I've tried switching them over to Debian machines. I've even tried switching them over to Apple machines. And for those of us tools who are still interested in the tool, um, well, I, I know a great solution is throw away the computer, shut off your cell phone, talk to the person in front of you instead of eating lunch with someone while you're on the fucking cell phone. Um, is, is the Linux failure just a just an issue of designing user interface because people don't know how people use the systems? Or is it something bigger than that? Probably little column A, little column B. I would have to, you know, I would have to do a lot more research to tell you exactly why that is. I mean, I just have my theory. My theory is that, um, you know, the people who make Linux software the server stuff is great because they actually have to use servers for stuff, but the desktop OS stuff is terrible because they never actually do any sort of real-world desktop OS computing, so they have no idea. So they make what they think is, is, a, good, is a good product, right? But in reality, it's, it's, it's completely useless out in the real world. I mean, OpenOffice, it's gotten better, but it's been a joke for a long, 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 long time. 
and it still is to a degree very much a joke. Any other questions? Comments? Oh. So you mentioned that in technology there's a lot of dead ends where people spend a lot of time building something that was delivered and it just didn't go anywhere because it was a failure. Mm -hmm. Isn't that part of the iterative process? Isn't that true in the real world, in our real relationship as well? There are well, some that are failures or not. So isn't that just sort of an outgrowth of the way humans interact? Well, of course, yeah. I mean, in any, in any process, there are, going to, there are going to be dead ends and things that go nowhere. The, th the point wasn't that there are dead ends. The point was that there were dead ends that people got really excited about and thought were the future and thought were, you know, this is the next big thing. And I can totally see a world where, you know, we're all going to have video phones. Doesn't really happen. So, any thoughts on how to deal with that? Um, the social side of getting really excited to try and do, build a tool for people to use that you watch the users, and then it turns out it's one of the dead ends. Because you mentioned tech burnout, and that's one of the things I'm seeing is you get excited about the thing you're doing, and then it's dead, and, and you invested so much in it because you thought it would be helpful. And then, mm -hmm. so any thoughts on that? How to deal with that? I hadn't, I hadn't considered that angle actually. Um, it's interesting. I'd have to think about it, but I'll think about it and I'll talk to you later about it. Yeah. Change of scenery. Yeah. <laughs> Often. Anybody else? Oh. Actually, to that point, something I've found um, after having done computers for as long as I have, why do we all have computer jobs? Because computers were something we did as a hobby. We got really, really into them. We got really good at them. Eventually, we realized, hey, we can make some cash at this. We all went into it. And our hobby is now our job. Yet a lot of us then go home and try to go back to making it our hobby as well, mm -hmm. and you end up being surrounded by it. I finish work. At, I finish work during the day, after having you know screamed at people about their servers all day long, and I go home and I scream at my own server. So part of that's where the burnout comes in. In some ways, you need a new hobby. Your hobby is now your livelihood, so you need to go take up fishing, or cross stitching, or something to the something else for you to do as a an aside that doesn't tie into your day job. Yeah. Because I've seen that a lot as people burn out over the years. It's because all they do is computers, 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 to the point where they don't want to see them anymore. Yeah. That's how I picked up disc jockeying, actually. <laughs> I got sick of the computer. I needed something else to do, which wasn't the, wasn't the computer. So there we go. Any other questions, comments? All right, thank you. <laughs>